So, hello everyone. Um, I have uh, uh, with me uh, uh, Bart McDonald. Bart McDonald is a very good friend and he is a HADS member now for um, how many years, Bart? Four years. Four years. Um, and uh, uh, he has an amazing and ever expanding organization uh, in Idaho and beyond. Um, and uh, I will ask him some, some questions. As a matter of fact, just before we started this, he asked me, he says, well, what questions are you going to ask me? And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not telling you. I want it to be just natural. So, um, okay. So, Bart, what, what, thank you for doing this, first of all. Um, and what, when you joined HADS, what made you join HADS? How come you decided to do that? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and actually, it's a question I've had to answer over and over to some of our providers from the standpoint that um, as we get somebody new on, they're, they're like, well, I've never seen this in physical therapy before. This is phenomenal. What led you to this path, right? Um, about four, four and a half years ago, I was working really closely um, with a sports medicine physician. And this is probably the first answer of a two-part answer. So I should tell you that. So the first part was very clinical. And I was working with a sports medicine physician here in one of our, next to one of our clinics. And he had sent me a patient with a shoulder injury that did not, in his, in his uh, understanding, need surgery. He did musculoskeletal ultrasound as a sports med medicine physician. And I was very intrigued. What he did in this case is he set this up for me, Demi, where he basically said, here's the image of the supraspinatus at the shoulder. And it's twice as big or as thick as what a normal tendon should be. And what I need you to do is perform physical therapy for the next six weeks and see if you can reduce the thickness of the supraspinatus tendon and hence avoid surgery for this patient. So as a background, this patient was, uh, was an engineer and, by day and a drummer by night. And so a lot of this overuse type of scenario on a ride symbol was, was cruising <laughs> for this right shoulder. And, uh, and this individual surely did not want, want surgery if they could avoid it. And so it was amazing. We did, we did physical therapy, if my memory serves, this is a few years back, but we did physical therapy, I wanna say for about five or six weeks, had very improved success. The patient reported, number one, um, I have better, I, I, don't, I don't wake up because of shoulder pain at night. So that was, that was a, a number, a really good improvement. And we're with A-STEM and some other treatment modalities that we were utilizing, some really, really low level strengthening as far as the dosage of, of strengthening for physical therapy for the rotator cuff, the sports medicine doctor, based on his ultrasound, has said, I don't want heavy strengthening. I know you guys like to go to eccentrics and really load this up, but we have some deficits with this cuff. We all want to be more careful than that. And I don't want to make it a full thickness tear. So I want you to be really careful. And so we followed through with that. And to make a long story short, after doing this low level physical therapy for about four to six weeks, he said, let's turn it up a notch. And, and as he did a follow-up ultrasound, the thickness of the supraspinatus had reduced by about 25%. And so he was like, you guys are awesome. You're doing phenomenally. Keep going, but do some strengthening because we got to really get to a, an end functional goal here. So we went ahead, increased the strengthening. Four weeks later, the patient goes back for a follow-up ultrasound with a sports med doc, and it's doubled again in size. In fact, it was worse than where we started, Dean. <laughs> And I about fell off my chair. I'm looking at this and I am, I'm just so dumbfounded because I can't figure out where's a physical therapist I've gone wrong. Yes. So really just struggled with it. Went in, talked to the sports med doctor. We had to go a different direction on this. And at the end of the day, I said, I really love this ultrasound thing that you're doing because what it's teaching me is that as a physical therapist without eyes on the inside of this shoulder, I am treating blind. I don't know how to dose, dose this appropriately in so many instances. Yeah, sometimes I have an MRI, but to MRI every patient is not cost effective for the patient. And it's not medically relevant for every case. So how, so I flat out just asked him, how can I do ultrasound? He's like, well, you know, there's very few of us sports med docs really in the country that are good at this. 
you've got to find a platform for education that can teach you guys how to do this. And he said, by the way, I, I would predict, and he's a pretty good, pretty smart guy. He said, within 10 years, Bart, within 10 years, 100% of good outpatient orthopedic PT practices will be doing this on a daily basis. So get on, get on board. So really, I had spoken with Demi at, uh, at private practice. I don't know if you remember this. This was a few years ago. And there was a small little, he had a little small little <laughs> vendor's stand. And I remember asking about ultrasound. And, and then you started talking to me about EMG. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I was clueless about EMG. But EMG and, uh, started to spark my interest because I recognized for testing, understanding the true presentation and pathology of my patients, and only relying on special tests, which sometimes have anywhere from, oh, uh, sensitivity of 25% all the way to maybe 50% on a good day for those these orthopedic tests, I was really treating blind, both from a spine and peripheral nerve aspect of treatment and care, as well as from a soft tissue issue with the, with the ultrasound. And so we connected back up, I connected back up with Demi, and basically was just begging that, how can we get this into our practice? Um, and I, I got to tell you, that's the answer to, or the first part of the, to that question. The second one really came in as Demi, then you opened my eyes to say, hey, look, Bart, what is your number one struggle financially with the practice? And of course, I don't know any outpatient PT owner that isn't going to say, well, it's reimbursements. Our reimbursements are going down. Like I, I don't know how to control this. In fact, I have very little control over this aspect of my business. The only way that I can do this and continue to legally, ethically, and provide a quality, I, I've got to have increased reimbursements. And honestly, it's not a thing. And, and Demi said, oh, no, no, it is a thing. It is a thing. You just have to be able to bring diagnostics into your practice. So at the end of the day, that's my two-part answer. I had to do it because of the quality of care that we want to provide for our patients, not treating blind anymore as, as physical therapists. If we're really going to call ourselves doctors of physical therapy, we'd, be able, we'd, we'd better be able to take for every patient that comes through our door and be able to tell the physician, this is the rehab potential. Good, very good, poor. What, what is the rehab potential? If you're gonna spend $2,000 in my clinic and 18 visits, whatever that looks like, do I really have a professional opinion and credibility behind that with diagnostics to back that up, objective data that says, I can get you better. And I know how to guide that PT plan of care to make it happen. So that's kind of awesome. kind of quality of care married with our, our current scene as PTs. We, we need to increase uh, our viability with, with increased reimbursement. Thank you. Now, um, I, I know that you have trained some uh, of your staff and, and uh, um, recently you uh, committed actually to train more of your staff. What does this mean, the training in diagnostics and the involvement of the practice and the staff members in diagnostics, uh, what does it mean for your staff members and how do you use this tool to excite staff members, to create um, a momentum in the practice or a, even I would say sustainability of staff? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, being in rural Idaho, and I don't know how many people listening out there today or in the future know what this looks like but we are we're stuck halfway between in salt lake city which is a very big city all the way to the north which is basically takes us all the way to yellowstone park so in the past we've really tried to capitalize on that dini and trying to attract and retain physical therapists and good physical therapists to our practice by stating hey look you can mountain bike here all summer long spring it's phenomenal you can ski We've got some of the best ski and, and snow to ski on in the winter, and you can do all these things, which is really natural to Idaho. But you really don't have a big city feel here. In fact, a lot of our practitioners in the past that have been attracted and stayed are people that have family here. And for a growing practice, that stunts our growth. That's not, that's not a great plan. So what, we, what we've seen as we've started to di the diagnostics is the easiest way 
is to give the therapist what they want. In other words, some therapists out there, they probably graduate from PT school. They don't want to crack a book again. They don't really want to learn and grow. They're going to do the same home exercise program with the same low back patients forever to the end of time. We're not interested in that PT. So in our practice from day one, even when we're interviewing, we introduce them to our practice by introducing diagnostics. I usually will do an ultrasound or a portion of an EMG on every single uh, new hire potential that comes in on interview. And their response has been phenomenal. Both as they will, in fact, we had just one just the other day. I won't, I won't put his name out there. But he had interviewed with several other practices um, from a local university. And we, we needed a hire. We needed a guy that was really bought in. And he was being offered more money at a different practice with perhaps some better benefits. And he chose us associated with the opportunity to come and do diagnostics. And, and really, they grab on to ultrasound because ultrasound really is netter in grayscale. Mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can visualize what's underneath that shoulder and that long head of biceps and what I think that should look like and that supraspinatus and infraspinatus and what kind of spacing and arrangement, and I can visualize that in netter for that new grad or even that, that, that long-term PT that has a lot of experience and then turn it around and put it in grayscale, all of a sudden it's like this light bulb goes on. Um, one of our most recent trainees, I should tell you this, you'd be thrilled, Jimmy, um, uh, John Goodman. He went out just one month ago, maybe five weeks ago, out to New, to New York to do a training in ultrasound. Uh, we had done some pre-training. We do that now because uh, Andy Good and I are, 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 are good at, uh, at doing some of these things. and We want to integrate it with our staff as much as possible. Sure. So John had some experience with it, went out to uh, New York, came back, and he has averaged seven to eight ultrasounds per week since he's come back. That's awesome. And he just identifies. Yeah, it's been awesome. It, it, he just identifies with his patients, those new patients or the patients that are not making progress that he needs to know that we didn't do enough up front to know what we were doing. And sometimes we're still guilty of that. But often the standard of care in our practice for new and old is we use diagnostics from day one to know which way to go. And the buy-in has been great. And the longevity, of course, in this gives us a five-year contract with these guys that I, I think is helpful for us in a big way. Yeah, and, and, and even from a financial point of view, uh, if you think that, okay, seven, eight of these ultrasounds, they're going to take uh, per week, they're going to take, um, let's say, I don't know, maybe four hours for the week for them to be done. And at the end of the day, for the month, they're going to yield somewhere in the neighborhood of five, six thousand dollars That is really a, a no-brainer. But I want to ask you about that. Um, now, a lot of the people who are watching this, right, and we have surveyed this, HADS has surveyed this, like the number one reason that people, before they get into HADS, when they are just looking at HADS, the number one reason they are looking at HADS is financial, because their reimbursements are very low. And we know that nationwide reimbursement in physical therapy is somewhere between 8 to 12%. That's nationwide, according to data from uh, uh, PPSA, PPA. So, Without asking you specifics about you and your practice, if the nationwide reimbursement is, let's say, somewhere 8 to 12 percent, somebody who joins, let's say, HADS and puts really the time and effort and applies the program as it is intended to be, uh, what overall would be, in whatever terms you want, you can describe it, but what yeah. would be the overall let's say financial benefit that someone will get? I'm not asking for numbers specifically, but what would be the overall financial benefit? Would the profit margins increase? Would the revenue increase? Would, what, what are the other areas where this person will realize a financial benefit and financial security for the practice? You know, and I, I know that in talking in these terms, it's going to vary from practice to practice, but I can just speak in terms of, of our practice. Our goal as we sat down at the beginning of 2019 was 
we recognized that we had gone down, I want to say 6% in our profit margin in the previous year. And we had not really gone down in number of visits. In fact, we had gone up, right? And so I think this is a common story for most PTs out there. I'm doing more and getting paid less. Because the reimbursement went down. Yes, yeah. And so what we, what we decided is, is that per unit of time, our, our best reimbursing activity is diagnostics, hands down. And so our next goal then be, became why having, so we've got three clinics right now or just opening our fourth. And so when we looked at this, our prior model, what I would say kind of our phase one model, which had, which had helped to get us started into diagnostics in the first place, was let's have just a few key people get good at this and then and maybe that's good. And what we recognized was is that the more knowledge that PTs have on an individual basis as a practitioner in diagnostics, whether it be EMG or ultrasound, the more they're going to use that for their patients. We knew this was true. And the more that they use it for their patients, the more that the quality of what we give to the patient goes way up and our reimbursements go up. So what we did is we said we want 100% of all of our PTs to be really attain, attain that FMSK certification. And we want that to happen within two years, which means this year we need a whole lot more of our P PTs trained. And now we have more of an internal mentorship follow-up because of the longevity that we've had with ultrasound and EMT here in our clinic. And so now it's really just snowballed. So when we talk about what does that mean to our practice financially, our intention, and, and I'll just throw this number out there because I think it's helpful for people to hear. Usually if we say, hey, we're going to open another practice, this is how we're going to beat decreasing reimbursements is we're just going to go volume, volume, volume. We've got to open another practice. For us in Idaho, that may cost us somewhere between two to $300,000, depending on what we're investing to start do a, a de novo startup. Okay, and I think that's fair depending on if you're doing a really good job with your equipment and space and what that looks like. Our, our goal was not necessarily to do that, not to add more brick and mortar, but how could we achieve not that deficit of two to 300,000, but how can we increase it to 200 to $300,000 in gross revenue without increasing our overhead? And diagnostics was it. Now, I have to tell you, in the amount of patients that our particular practices see that are peripheral joint in injuries, it really made sense to put our focus on ultrasound first. Now we do quite a bit of EMG and I, I'll, you'll get me talking about that, Demi, and we'll never stop. But I do just have to tell you, our goal was to get seven practitioners doing a minimum of five EMGs, uh, sorry, five musculoskeletal ultrasounds a week, we knew they had the caseload to make that medically necessary. We're not asking anybody to do anything that is not correct for the patient. And that the gross profit or gross revenue, I should say, for the year would be an additional $360,000. Wow. Awesome. That's, 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 that's very good. That's very good. Uh, now, um, what do you see as the future being of the physical therapy profession? What challenges, like the major challenges you see for the PT profession uh, in the future and what role diagnostics can play to mitigate or provide solutions for those challenges? Uh, that's a great question. And I think I, just going to PPS this last week, we, there's a lot, of, a lot of conversation on this, right? We want to be the doctor of physical therapy. We want to be the musculoskeletal diagnosti diagnostician and specialist. We want to be a little closer to that, that military model for providing care. Why do we want to be that? Well, we have, we have the expertise in that area. We, but the other, the other reason is, is that that is the most economical model, in my opinion, for the United, States, the United States healthcare conundrum that we find ourselves in right now. It's out of control. Our spending is out of control. And when you start listening to our orthopedic surgeons in our area and asking them, what are your, what are your, some of your hardest problems? Of course, they all going to complain about reimbursements too. But, but one of the other things that they bring up is that they are being beat up by Blue Cross 
because they're being told, hey, look, you guys are ordering too many MRIs. You're too much diagnostics from the standpoint of the cost of an MRI, two or three thousand dollars a whack. And every patient that comes into your office that has some kind of a shoulder problem, a knee problem, an ankle problem, whatever, we're just imaging, imaging, imaging at such a high rate. And so it's been really interesting to listen to those orthopedic surgeons and some of those other sports med doctors push us as a PT practice to say, get into this because it's cost effective. Now, how do we marry those two things in kind of where does the future of PT lie? It really does align. Uh, it, we arrive when we essentially align our goals with recognizing who we really are with diagnostics in a cost-effective way. And that's what ultrasound and EMG provides for us that we can't get any other way. We just don't have, we've said it before, sensitivity specificity by hands on alone. We marry our orthopedic exam with diagnostics. And when I say that, it's not at an MRI rate. So it's saving the, the taxpayers, if we're talking about government payers, we're, we're saving families, we're saving really all of our friends and neighbors thousands of dollars within our community and the broken system we now can be part of fixing that broken system awesome. so this really is this really is the only way I, I really feel like you're gonna have two groups of PTs over the next five years you're gonna have the one group that has lower and lower reimbursements and becomes less and less of a credible um, contributor to the medical model and then you're going to have diagnostics for PTs married in those practices that are saving medical dollars. In fact, if I can just have a little tangent, I had a gal that came in a few weeks ago. I'm presenting on this at, at tonight's webinar. Um, she came in with anterior hip pain. And uh, I did my orthopedic exam. I had a little bit of range of motion deficits um, at the hip. We had weakness that was about three plus and painful at most of those motions, including um, really the hip flexors. Uh, abductors were in that same group, extensors. I mean, it's kind of global. I do a scour test and I, I get kind of a plus minus on that, it's kind of painful. Do some impingement tests, I guess, kind of plus minus on that too. Ended up just going right to the ultrasound. She's got OA galore. Big, huge bone spur. And that anterior capsule just, just really, I mean, no wonder it hurt. The patient took one look and said, oh my goodness, <laughs> he isn't going to help me, right? And, and we did do a little PT as we then referred her on to the orthopedic surgeon, became a viable, a really a viable part of the team as a physical therapist with an image that was super cheap compared to everything else, showed that bone spur, went back to the GP, then I held the hand with the patient to go up there to the orthopedic surgeon, and I referred to the patient for surgery. And your credibility level goes up there. Oh, yes. Yeah. So just as an aside, there's, from a marketability standpoint, I have to tell you, Dimi, there are statements made by GPs, especially PAs and NPs, which I know there's a lot of PTs that get a lot of referrals from these guys. And... As of the last six months, there's been two or three different groups that say, we only send shoulders to superior physical therapy. Why? Because we get, we get results and we get a diagnostic-driven plan of care so that we know we're not wasting money on PT. Awesome. We're only going to use PT when it's going to work. Awesome. So I think that really is the future of PT. And hopefully that wasn't too long. But I could probably keep going. Look, here's the thing. Actually, I, I asked you, the, like the, the basic questions or whatever I could think of that could be useful to the people who are watching this. But, you know, if anybody wants to talk to you directly, how can they reach, reach you? How, how can they contact you? You know, I, I, you can always shoot me an email. Um, I'll just tell you my email address is Bart M, as in McDonald, but Bart M P T at gmail.com. Okay. And usually I try to resolve, uh, try to reserve my schedule half hour, an hour each week just to be able to answer questions on this. Uh, mostly because I don't know if you guys ever feel this. I've got a mother in law, and, I, and, and this is kind of funny, but she finds a product at Costco. This is funny, but 
and she will sell it to 100% of all of her friends and neighbors, <laughs> right? Does Costco give her a kickback? No. Is she making any money on that at all? Absolutely not. Now, as I'm laughing at her the other day on this, she made fun of me in the same way. She's like, well, that's, that's that diagnostic stuff that you do for PT is the same way. Didn't you just go down to the Utah section for the, uh, for the Physical Therapy Association of Utah and set up a vendor booth and go and talk to people, as many people as you could about this? I'm like, yeah, why'd you do it? Well, because I know it's the right way for the profession. This is, this is it. And, uh, and, and so if you're like me as another PT out there, sometimes you just get to the things that you, you know are benefit for the patient, benefit for the practice, benefit for the medical community at large that enable you to become who you want to be and then you can't quit talking about it. And so that's why Demi hasn't got an edge, a word in edgewise is because I, I can't stop talking. So. Thank you, Bart. And, 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 and the truth of the matter is, and I say that to people uh, when I talk to them on the phone, that um, aside from the money, the reimbursement and all that stuff we have created here with all the HUD members around the country, uh, we have created a movement uh, where we are changing really the future of the physical therapy profession and and Bart is uh, a leader in that uh, in that change in that process so thank you so much for uh, doing this uh, today and uh, those of you who uh, want more information uh, you can go to diagnostics for pt.com or ptmadeeasy.com to get more information about HADS and its products. Thank you.